So uh, we're here to talk about the end of the modern world by Romano Guardini. Uh, for this first presentation, I wanted to do it in three sections where we talk about Guardini, we talk about me slash the Morn Academy, which with this intimate group of people, maybe we don't need to do as much talking about. Uh, and uh, I want to talk about the beginning of the book. Um, and at the end of these sections, I just wanted to stop and we could have little discussions if people want to add any comments, questions, criticisms, condemnations, et cetera. Uh, we can do them there. Uh, so Romano Guardini was born in 1855. He died in six, 1968. Um, he was fluent in many languages. He studied chemistry and economics before deciding to become a priest. Uh, he criticized the Nazi co-optation of Christianity, resulting in exile from Berlin, from his teaching position in Berlin. Um, he was a prolific writer, and he greatly influenced the resource mod theologians um, that were becoming increasingly prominent in the Catholic Church. Um, and therefore, he had an effect on the outcome of Vatican II. Uh, Pope Paul VI offered to make him a cardinal in 65, but he declined. Um, in December 2017, he was designated a servant of God, which is the first step, official step towards becoming a saint. Uh, his books were often studies of modern situations and problems prudently approached from the Catholic tradition. Um, he tried to empathetically enter into the worldviews of ancient and modern thinkers and to make sense of them both on their own terms and in the light of faith. Um, as far as his influence goes, his, his book, The Spirit of the Liturgy, deeply impacted the future popes, Paul VI and Benedict XVI, who uh, made various de decisions about how the liturgy would be reformed after Vatican II. Um, Ratzinger slash Pope Benedict's own Spirit of the Liturgy was titled in Guardini's on honor. He often quoted from him during his pontificate, and he praised him as a great figure, a Christian interpreter of the world and of his time. He was also influential on Henri de Lubac and Hans Urs von Balthasar, who with Ratzinger started the Communio Journal. Uh, he influenced Karl Rahner, Karl Rahner Joseph Pieper, Luigi Giussani. Uh, Peter Morin introduced Dorothy Day to his work early on during his like catechesis of her. And she liked to quote his line about how the church is the cross on which Christ is crucified, by which she meant it's always falling short of its potential and betraying uh, its founder and Lord's original intention. Pope Francis planned to do a PhD on Guardini that never got completed. Um, and outside of former popes, Guardini was the most frequently cited source in Laudato Si. The encyclical on the environment. Um, I wanted to share these brief quotes from an audience Pope Francis had in 2015. Um, there's a Romano Guardini Institute and they were hosting a conference and he wanted to talk to them. And he said, I'm just pulling a few quotes out. He says, I am certain that Guardini is a thinker who has much to say to the people of our time and not only to Christians. Perhaps we can apply Guardini's reflections to our time seeking to discover God's hand in present day events, then perhaps we will be able to recognize that God in his wisdom has sent to us in wealthy Europe, the hungry that we give them food, the thirsty that we give them drink, strangers that we welcome them and the naked that we clothe them. History will then demonstrate that if we are a people, we will certainly welcome them as our brothers. If we are only a group of more or less organized individuals, we will be tempted to save our skin, first of all, but we will not have continuity. I thank you all once again for your presence. May your work with Guardini's writings bring you to an ever greater understanding of the meaning and value of the Christian foundations of culture and society. Um, so he's got a lot of big fans. Um, I wanted to talk about his context as well. So he was ordained a diocesan priest in 1910. Um, and while working on what we would call his postgraduate degrees, uh, he was a hospital orderly during World War I. He was a parish priest and a youth chaplain. Um, after his habilitation, which in my understanding in Germany, that's basically like your finalized PhD, um, 
he completed that in 22. And from there, he focused on writing and teaching until retiring at 62. Um, so he was active, you know, from basically World War I through the early 60s. Um, the book we're, we're reading was published in 56. Um, I pulled this section out of uh, this book about his influence on Vatican II to just kind of give the, the cultural lay of the land. Uh, the author writes that by the early 1900s, other voices were also questioning the new political and social order. Some German intellectuals, influenced by neo-romanticism, noted the effects of their nation's industrialization upon society and doubted whether the changes brought about by modernization had been for the best. They observed that whereas in 1871, 36% of the German people lived in cities, in 1910, 60% resided in urban areas where they often endured inadequate housing, air pollution, poor health, and unemployment. Also over these 40 years, the German population had jumped from 40 million to 65 million, thereby causing anxiety about sufficient living space and the quality of life in the future. Criticism sharpened during World War I as its violence cast a dark shadow across the Aufklärungs, which is German for enlightenment, the enlightenment's beliefs in the sufficiency of human reason, the goodness of human nature, and the idea of progress. During the post-war years, conservative views came to expression and books written by Oswald Spengler, Carl Jasper, Max Scheller, Martin Heidegger. At the same time, many Protestants felt betrayed by the quote unquote cultural Protestantism of Adolf Harnack and Ernst Rolsch and discovered the neo-Orthodox theologies of Karl Barth, Rudolf Bultmann, and Friedrich Gogarten. Amid this social criticism by Catholic officials, conservative intellectuals, and dialectical theologians, Romano Guardini worked to resolve his outlook on contemporary German society. Um, and I just wanted to highlight, th these are one of my, uh, my pet issues that I just, I find pretty rich to think about, but part of especially the conservative concern about where society was headed was um, if we don't end in just like utter self-destruction um, would we have created a society where we have been so sort of homogenized and bureaucratized and like massified that uh, there would be no true humanity left, no, no spiritual substance to people because we would all just kind of be these, these walking zombies. Um, and so that this is where Nietzsche, one of his prophecies is that the last man's coming. And so this famous passage from Thus Spoke Zarathustra, he writes um, that it is time for man to fix his goal. It is time for man to plant the germ of his highest hope. And this is where he's talk, trying to amp people up to be supermen. Still is his soil rich enough for it, but that soil will one day be poor and exhausted and no lofty tree will any longer be able to grow thereon. Alas, there come at the time when man will no longer launch the arrow of his longing beyond man, and the string of his bow will have unlearned to whiz. I tell you, one must still have chaos in one to give birth to a dancing star. I tell you, you still have chaos in you. Alas, there come at the time when man will no longer give birth to any star. Alas, there come at the time of the most despicable man who can no longer despise himself. Lo, I show you the last man, and then in, in, in quotes, he's, he's speaking for him. What is love? What is creation? What is longing? What is a star? So ask us the, the last man and he blinks, um, which I, at least my interpretation of this is he's saying these are like nonsense questions to the this last man of the future, that these are concepts that they have no meaning. What, what would it even mean to long for things or what would it mean to be created or yeah. What is love? Um, you know, and this isn't just a, a Nietzschean concern. Conservatives had it, so our conservatives all over the place had it. So th there's the famous Hollow Men poem from T.S. Eliot, where he starts out by saying, "We are the Hollow Men. We are the Stuffed Man, leaning together, headpiece filled with straw, filled with straw. Alas, our dry voices, when we whisper together, are quiet and meaningless, as wind and dry grass, or rats' feet over, or rats' feet over broken glass." Um, but these are the concerns people are having um, before World War I and the interwar years afterwards. Um, he goes on, this is the dead land. This is cactus land. This is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but with a whimper. Um, 
And so just off that section we read on the Romano Guardini precursor to the modern world, I wanted to read one more section. Romano Guardini brought his theory of opposition in his view of the Enlightenment and the social tendencies within Germany. On the one hand, he disapproved of some aspects of the Enlightenment. For example, its emphasis upon self-autonomy and the separation of social and cultural life from the church. On the other hand, he also perceived the merits of the Enlightenment. For instance, the breakthroughs in the natural sciences and engineering. Further, he realized that the West could not return to the medieval world. As Guardini explains in some of his texts, including that Dawson or Duzit is into the modern world, the dream of restoring the Middle Ages political, social, and cultural order is a flawed neo-romantic idea. A realistic assessment recognizes that we cannot go back to an earlier era and that we are, in fact, living through the end of the modern era. At this time, Christians must reject the lure of the past and shape the present and future in the light of J.D.A.O. Christian wisdom. So that's where he, he's coming from. To end this introduction, I wanted one more great quote from Hans Urs von Balthasar in his book on Guardini. He ends the introduction by saying, one thing is certain. Guardini did not erect any vain structures at the edge of history. Rather, he built shelters for entire generations, indeed, bulwarks against the encroaching desert. This house stands firm on solid rock, whether or not his style suits us. Those who have truly recognized his spirit will owe him a debt of gratitude again and again, even if they are preparing to continue on further. So um, that's the end of my intro to Guardini. Do people have any comments or questions? Or so let's begin the book. So I wanted to read just a little bit from the author's introduction. Um, and since I don't have a Kindle, this is just photos of, of my book so you can see how neurotically I highlight things. Uh, hopefully it doesn't get in the way. Uh, so Guardini writes, he belongs to that company of men, uh, and he he's talking about this grew out of a lecture series he did on Blaise Pascal. Pascal belongs to that company of men who saw the whole situation of the new world, which was then coming to be. Whereas his great contemporary and antagonist Descartes was completely merged into that shaping world. Pascal surmounts and reaches beyond the modern age. This is true both because Pascal formulated a philosophy and an ethics whose significance is only now being fully revealed, and because he assumed a critical attitude toward that newer world. From Pascal's life and thought emerge questions about the nature of his age and about his engagement with it. Um, and, and this is, I think, self-consciously what Guardini himself is trying to do. He's trying to say uh, Descartes was kind of at the cusp of the modern world and he he saw what was good about it and he saw what was going to be very problematic and i think what guardini is trying to do is say i'm at the cusp of the postmodern world whatever it's going to be called and i'm seeing what's good about it and what the dangers are and, and what we should be on the lookout for but he sets up this dichotomy we'll go back to about basically descartes versus pascal descartes being just one with the zeitgeist, just thinking everything's good and progressing. And Pascal is kind of against and beyond the modern age. Um, so further in the introduction, he writes, um, the task of doing this class, because in all crucial respects, the modern world has come to an end. Since the spirit of an age becomes wholly clear only when it has begun to vanish from the face of the earth, it has been possible to draw a picture of the modern world without falling victim either in a spirit of admiration or of hatred to the thing represented. Of itself, my work led me into further studies, which threw a shaft of light onto the epoch which is coming but is still unknown. It disclosed how deeply penetrating is the change everywhere passing over the world. It intimated the task which man will then have to face. And then a few paragraphs down, he, he notes that the situation is a tangled and fluid situation, and his, his remarks in this book are tentative. He's trying to figure it out, but he's being both bold and humble um, in, in his prognosis of how we got here and where we're going. So for chapter one, uh, or the first section, he, he titles it A Search for Orientation. So we're gonna spend a lot of time just kind of getting settled in and figuring out how we got here. Um, chapter one's the sense of being in the world picture of the Middle Ages. Um, 
So the first paragraph of the book, he says, if we are to recapture that vision of the world which medieval man made his own, we must begin with what the Middle Ages had in common with classical antiquity. In neither period can we find the conception which is so familiar to us of an unending space-time relationship. Both ages saw the world and, more significantly, felt it to be a limited frame, a ball or sphere. And I just, I wanted to highlight two sections in this first paragraph. He, he's saying it's obvious to us that reality uh, or th the world picture that we have is of an unending space-time relationship, that space and time more or less go on forever, uh, out into outer space and then into the future. And he also says uh, ancient people didn't see it that way. And more than they didn't think about things that way, they didn't feel it to be that way. And that's where he says they felt it to be a limited frame of all. Um, so he sets up the, the more or less normal structure of there's antiquity. So like the Greco-Roman past and then the Middle Ages and then modernity and then whatever's coming after this that he's going to try and articulate. So he starts by focusing on antiquity. And he writes that from his rigid, from his meaning like the Greek, Greek humanity, from his religious conviction, he knew a highest father of the gods of, and men. But this father belonged to his own world, just as did the vaults of heaven. In truth, he was their very spirit. Classical man knew the power of a fate which commanded his world. He knew of a governing justice and of a reasonable order for all things. These forces, all powerful though they were, did not stand beyond the world, but formed within it its ultimate order. So uh, I've got a picture on the left of like the Ptolemaic cosmos, where you have like the earth in the middle and then radiating out the different spheres. And ultimately what he's saying is there was some conception that there was like the Mount Olympia of the cosmos. There was like the realm where the all father lived, but even that realm wasn't some transcendent beyond as we take for granted um, after monotheism, but it was even that most transcendent realm was like part of the sky and it it was all part of this orb. And even when it, we read it like, oh, they're talking about transcendence, Guardini saying, no, they did not mean transcendence in the way that we mean it. They mean it was all still enclosed, is his argument. And so he writes his, again, Greek humanities vision resulted from a mental act which sets limits to his being, which fended off the chaotic and the indefinite and which renounced every excess. It also developed from a sense of harmony in which existence was perceived as a beautifully ordered cosmion. Consequently, classical man did not attempt the comprehension which was so characteristic of medieval man the world comprehended as a whole within which each individual was assigned a necessary place. Life for classical man remained open and problematic. And what I find interesting about this passage is, is he is noting a kind of paradox that he's saying they thought and especially felt their world to be self-enclosed and, and hemmed in. But on the other hand, uh, their the life they experienced was always open and problematic because they didn't know you you could do he, he talks about how greek philosophers were always going over and over about how does the world work what is true how do we know things there was this constant like agnosticism hemmed in by feeling like there was nothing beyond that so um and then guardini basically makes the claim that uh, what changed, why, why we're all post-Christian subjects um, in, in a super broad sense, not in, not in the way that that term gets used in theology these days, is because uh, God was born, the incarnation, and then the resurrection. And what happened in that event was something that the Greek world could have never conceived of, which was uh, an absolutely transcendent God breaking into our world. Um, and that the nature of this God was intrinsically different from like say Zeus or someone like that, because Zeus is still an eminent uh, sort of God. And so Guardini writes, uh, he has a section on the doctrine of creation. He says, it is what most decisively reveals the power of God, the infinite, the infinite sovereign. The world was created out of nothing by the freedom of the almighty whose commanding word gives to all things being in nature of itself 
Oh, being in nature. Of itself, that world lacks any trace of internal necessity or external possibility. This created universe is found only in the Bible. Elsewhere, the origin of the universe was always thought to have been mythical. Either some formless chaos had evolved into the world, or some divine power had fashioned it from an equally formless chaos. The revelation of scripture contradicted all such myth. The world is created by a God who does not have to create in order that he might be, nor does he need the elements of the world in order that he might create. So what he's saying here is like this conception of God is, is beyond uh, what the Greco-Romans had imagined in their conceptions of God, because they needed at the very least this formless chaos out of which they usually like emerge already to kind of wrestle with that chaos. Um, and so I have this picture here on the left to kind of show the difference between there's just this enclosed world in antiquity. And, and this is a famous medieval painting on astronomy where the astronomer is kind of trying to puncture uh, the imminent material world to like look into the spiritual realm. And so kind of along these lines, Gordini has this section where he writes, D deeply significant for the new religious outlook of medieval man was the influx of the Germanic spirit. The religious bent of the Nordic myths, the restlessness of the migrating peoples, and the armed marches of the Germanic tribes revealed a new spirit which burst everywhere into history like a spear thrust into the infinite. This mobile and nervous soul worked itself into the Christian affirmation, and there it grew mightily. In its fullness, it produced that immense medieval drive which aimed at cracking the boundaries of the world. So again, that picture, trying to get beyond the world to God's world, to transcendence. So, so he's setting up like a dichotomy here between, so we have antiquity here on the left and the Middle Ages on the right. And then you, on the left, you have the Greek and the Roman politics. And on the right, you have this Germanic spirit he's talking about. And in antiquity, they were constantly exploring the world around them, but they were also being open and agnostic about it because who's to say? But on the right, um, he, he characterized it as this nervous mobility where people are constantly trying to get past eminence towards the transcendent. And then uh, to me, what's kind of interesting is he goes on to say, this medieval impatience with all limitations cannot be explained, however, simply in terms of the Christian view of man and his relationship to God. Nothing akin to the medieval drive can be found in the first centuries of the faith, when the classical sense of limitation still retained its hold on Christian man. Although he experienced transcendence, he experienced it only as an inner freedom from the world and as a personal responsibility for his own life, a responsibility transcending the demands and service of society. Only after the Germanic ferment had quickened the, Euro the European world Throughout the course and aftermath of migrations, was man's relation to God freed from the boundaries fixed by antiquity. Only then did man scale the barriers of the world and reach into the infinite that he might embrace the Godhead and return from him to make all things new. The Germanic longing to embrace the whole of being was one with the drive for transcendence. The Germanic spirit wished to surround the world in order to penetrate it completely. This passion, both to embrace and to enter deeply the full sweep of existence, explains the new vision of the world fashioned by medieval man. We shall now study uh, from several points of view what that looks like. Um, and, and what I, there's multiple interesting things in that passage, but one of them is he's distinguishing. So he's saying there's antiquity and there's this Germanic spirit where they were trying to basically push past the boundaries of antiquity. But different than that is like Judeo-Christian revelation. So there's two separate things. And, the, and the, the Christian revelation, like in the first centuries, was hemmed in by that antique view. Um, but, but once all these uh, neurotic Germans come in, uh, it kind of changes the nature of like actually existing Christianity is what I, I take him to be saying. Um. So describing medieval man, Guardini says he was interested in building his world out of the content of revelation and upon the principles and insights of classical philosophy. The Summa, 
are that world as it was erected by the human mind. They are a world in which vast differences were fused into a powerful synthesis. They can be compared with the medieval cathedral in which every form and artifact, even the simplest materials of construction, were given a symbolic value, which made possible a life and a sense of being integrally religious in nature. So I've kind of cobbled together this image of how I, I think what he's saying is that uh, in the Middle Ages, there was a synthesis that occurs where uh, everything was, you know, kind of dominated by church and state to, to, at the risk of putting these in liberal terms, that there was divine revelation and that divine revolution or, or the divine revelation uh, authorized the church hierarchy and the uh, imperial and feudal hierarchy. And all of this Greek learning, uh, especially once Aristotle was, was brought back to the West, um, was synthesized with this Christianity and, and with this Germanic spirit longing for the infinite. And uh, his claim is that's what explains Aquinas and Dante and, and the culture of especially the high Middle Ages at its peak. Um, so another way he characterized medieval thinkers is he says they went directly to the world of existing things, to those things which he experienced immediately in sensation. He reflected upon their essences and status within the interdependent order of creation, ordering. From those reflections, medieval man garnered a wisdom which even today has its value. Medieval anthropology, for example, in both principle and application, is superior to its modern counterpart. In morality and moral attitude, medieval life had a firmer yet richer hold on reality than is possible for modern man. It also made possible a fuller perfecting of human nature. In social philosophy and jurisprudence, medieval thought encompassed and ordered its concrete cultural si situation to its own time, yet it offers insights which have basic validity for man at any time. And, and one of Guardini's critiques of modernity is, as we've let go, of these, of the contemplation of essences and tradition and revealed uh, moral theology, um, that then kind of anything goes. We're back at that dictatorship of relativism that I referenced with Pope Benedict, um, and and why he sees, in terms of morality, the Middle Ages as superior because there were a lot more structures, expectations, doctrine around what what is and is not a good way to live. Um, but he says. What medieval man lacked was any desire for exact empirical knowledge of reality, and he did run the risk of merely repeating the classical authorities under whose discipline he had placed himself. And this is kind of, this is where he says the break with the modern world's going to happen. Um, one last section here on the Middle Ages before we get to modernity. He says, Dante's Divine Comedy, and over here on the left, I have kind of the updated the, the Christianized Ptolemaic cosmology, where before it was a ball, and now it's a ball going up to heaven and then beyond. Um, Dante's Divine Comedy is perhaps the most powerful embodiment of this medieval sense of the unity of all things and being, written at the end of the High Middle Ages, at the very moment when the medieval spirit had begun to ebb, the Divine Comedy stands alone. The medieval drama seen against the background of impending darkness was loved to the more to, by Dante. In his pages, it shines with a transfigured beauty. Um, and got a little bit ahead of myself. We have a few more medieval slides. So towards the end, Guardini strikes this kind of, I guess I'll call it a historicist stance in the sense that um, He's saying there are different times and epochs where different human potentials can unfold themselves or not. And he's saying uh, his standard that he'll say here at the top of page 23 is what makes civilizations good or bad is to what extent did they allow for the full development of human dignity. And he claims that the medieval achievement was so magnificent that it stands with the loftiest moments in history. Um, and where that, I mean, using the Divine Comedy as an example, it's important is not, is not so much did it accurately map 
uh, the material cosmos? Was it empirically valid? But more so, was it figuratively true in such a way that it allowed people to be virtuous and increase their likelihood of becoming saints? Um, I, I think that's a valid interpretation of what Wardeen is trying to say here. And so, yeah, this is a photo slide of Guardini beholding this medieval synthesis. And he ends, he ends chapter one with these two paragraphs. He says, it is cheap and false to condemn the medieval use of authority as slavery, quote unquote. Modern man makes this judgment not merely because he enjoys the discovery of autonomous investigation, but because he resents the Middle Ages. His resentment is born of the realization that his own age has made revolution a permanent institution. But authority is needed not only by the childish, but also in the life of every man, even the most mature. Integral to the full grandeur of human dignity, authority is not merely the refuge of the weak. Its destruction always breeds its burlesque force. As long as medieval man was gripped by his own vision of existence, as long as he heard its music sounding in the depths of his heart, he never experienced authority as shackling. It was a bridge leading to the absolute. It was the flag of the world. Authority provided medieval man with the opportunity to construct an order whose magnificence of form, intensity of manner, and richness of life were such that he would have judged our world as paltry. So I think that's just, it's a, it's a beautiful section. Um, any comments or questions? <laughs>